Okay, morning everyone. Um, my name's Peter Murray. I work with the Brisbane City Council in the survey area. Um, this morning it's not going to be a highly technical paper. It's more about our journey with point clouds on how we got here. No particular projects, just some war stories. Um, as a bit of an introduction, seeing there's so many new hands here, people might not realise Brisbane is actually run as one large local authority. The stats are there, 1.2 million people, 130, what is it, 1,367 square kilometres. It's about 70 k north to south, 140 east to west, going out to um, Morton Island there. 3.1 million budget, and that's sort of what they spend their money on. A lot of traffic management, public transport, park safety space, and so on. That goes down to that money's not spent all on infrastructure, but things like free Wi-Fi in the park. So the money's got to go a long way. What it does mean is we get a great deal of variety in our work. We meet lots of people. There's hard to say. There's seven, eight thousand people work in the organisation. Where we work, it's called City um, Project Office. That's responsible for delivering infrastructure in Brisbane. But down in our little area, planning and design, there's, once again, hard to say at any particular time. It's pretty maxed out at the moment, but 250, 350 people. And the sort of people we get there are listed in no particular order except surveyors are at the top and everybody else fits in. But that gives you an idea of the sorts of people we deal with. So it's um, out of that you get a great variety of work. So it's... Um, quite interesting. And being in Brisbane with the big budget, there are some large projects, but lots and lots of small ones as well. Okay. Now, I'm assuming from my journey through point clouds that there's not... There could be a few experts here, but I'm probably fairly safe. So what I'm intending to do is just go through a bit of a rundown on what point clouds are, as a bit of a background for everyone. Basically, a point cloud is just a collection of points. They're unrelated, they look like they're related, but they're totally unrelated. These go into the thousands and billions. The way these things are collected now is laser scanning of many varieties, and I'll touch on them. So, uh, yeah, basically just a big bunch of points, which will cause issues. As people know, when your projects get bigger, you have problems. So how do we get a point cloud? basically through terrestrial scanning or scanning. Laser scanning is the major way. It comes in various flavours, terrestrial, mobile, aerial. We can generate it through um, photogrammic uh, techniques. Noel touched on that yesterday. And um, they even go down to hydrographic surveys. We've got point clouds, but they're... Survey, they have surveys, but they're basically point clouds. They are lots of points with lots of detail. If you look at the um, search for the plane that was lost in the Indian Ocean, they found boats and things like that. That's basically point clouds out of bathymetric surveys. Get a great deal of detail. And how long have they been around? Since about the mid-1990s. Now, if you think about it, how many technologies have been around since the 1990s and still are looking for a mainstream home. That's the sort of issue that I have with them. They have particular purposes, and a lot of money's been spent on them, and they've had a lot of promise, been a lot of hype, but they haven't moved on that much since the 1990s. The technology's moved on, they collect a lot more points, but we're still looking for use. We've got uses, but not what you'd really hope. So why are they hung around? Well, they appear to be very detailed and intuitive. Now, Steve touched on this yesterday with his Love Island. I think I've sort of been struggling to how you, how you describe it, but they really do look good. They look like they're loaded with information because they look like a photo, and people tell you you can measure between the points, and you can. They're fairly cheap to collect. You can go out particularly with the um, LIDAR, you can get huge amounts of information that would take surveyors years to collect, and it's a matter of days. You can get into very difficult areas. 
which is one of the things. Safety is a big issue. If you can't get onto major freeways and stuff like that, there's areas which are dangerous, industrial areas. You can get a scanner in there and you can measure it. You can send in drones and, and uh, measure them. I think Catherine had mentioned that yesterday, like going into Fukushima, you can send in a drone and measure these things. Point clouds have somehow become intertwined with BIM. Um, and seeing BIM is unavoidable, now point clouds are becoming unavoidable. I think they will become mainstream just because of the prevalence of them and as time goes on they'll become more and more prevalent because they're, these LIDAR scanners are starting to appear in your car. Your car parks itself by having a LIDAR scanner in there to figure out what's around it. So as the price of scanners come down, Point clouds have become more and more common, therefore there's going to be greater and greater pressure to use them. Why not? You need a really specialised skill set. They look simple, but in my time, you find out that there are a lot of specialised skills needed to produce a really good point cloud. The size of the data sets becomes an issue, just shifting them around. We've got one point cloud at work, 130 gig which is a big file. But when you realise that that 130 gig has to be translated into a format that 12D can use, your 130 gig is turned into about 260 gig. You've got to manage on your network somewhere. And networks don't like files of that size. They don't fit well with your traditional design processes. Somebody told me once, the problem with the point clouds is and why they haven't been adopted is because designers aren't designing in point clouds. So ultimately, it's the designer's fault that they haven't taken off, which I thought was a nice twist to everything. <laughs> They're technology hungry. If you're shuffling that many points around in a computer, you've got to have good computer system, you've got to have good software, and just the whole shifting that amount of data. Okay, just run through a few of the different ways we collect our data sets. LiDAR is a point cloud data set. That slide showed up yesterday. Basically, it's you're generated by a plane flying over the ground with the lasers pointing out below it, measuring down. The laser hits the ground. The laser beams reflected back up to the plane. The plane takes a whole lot of measurements and figures out how far it is to the ground, how many times that when the laser beam leaves the plane, it might hit a leaf on a tree on the way down, part of the laser beam hits the leaf, the next bit hits the trunk, and the bit that lifts over hits the ground, then three of those reflections go back up to the plane and the plane records all of them. And while it's doing that, it's doing about two million of these, at least two million of these a second. So there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, it's basically just a big data set. In our place, we've used it for floodplains, floodplain modelling. It's brilliant for that. But it has one issue with that. The natural enemy of LIDAR is vegetation and water. And guess what our flood modellers do? They're interested in the bits of ground that have got vegetation and water. So, But on the floodplains, excellent. Um, we use them for concept designs. Our road designers use them for concept designs. We've used the information of that when all our volumetric resumptions are around the tunnels through Brisbane. Um, they're pretty well settled down. They're regularly used, um, well incorporated into our workflows. So that's pretty, well, go the other way. Um, and what have we learned out of all that? Now this has been going on, we've been using these since, I don't know, 2010 or something like that. You don't need every point in a point cloud. It sounds good to have a, you know, a billion points defining something, but you don't need that many points. Once again, Steve's Love Island analogy. The other thing we've learned is not every point is reliable. They do give you these um, stats and specifications, which makes it sound like everything is in width or everything is within about 150 mil. But when you read the fine print, it says 95% of all good strikes are within 150 mil. But you don't know how many are good strikes in there. As I said, these things bounce off trees and leaves and everything. On road surfaces, quite good. 
when you get out in the in the more bushy bits, the worst error I've found, I wouldn't call, well, it's, we call it an error, but it's measured correctly to what it measured to, it was just classified incorrectly, it was about eight metres. But there's no way looking at that data you can tell that that point is eight metres off where you would expect it to be. Okay, LiDAR over time evolved into LAS files, and that has categories in it, which is very useful in LAS files. Noel touched on it yesterday, and categories are generated when the reflection is bounced off the leaves and trees and all that. And it can tell whether it's hit the ground or it has a guess when it's hit the ground, whether it's bounced off vegetation, off roofs, and all that sort of thing. Very useful. You can filter out a lot of stuff with the categories and you can use your, your LiDAR data then for getting roof heights and interpolating floor levels and all sorts of stuff. So they're quite, quite useful within the, using the caveats of you're not 100% sure. But when you get a point in a computer, they all look as good as the others, don't they? They're all there to three, four, eight decimal places, however many you want. Um, we've developed workflows to integrate this stuff. We've got a um, little macro there that you just pick the point, or pick a polygon and it loads all the tiles you need and that sort of thing. And then we've got a filter data option we had. And what that does, it takes about, reduces those point clouds down to about 12% of the original and still produces a surface that is near enough to what you had. Given that I've, what I said about the reliability of the points and how it interprets them, I think if you're getting within the 150 mil of a surface that might be, well, it's better than a 150 mil of a surface that could be within metres, um, you're not doing too badly. Plus, an interesting fact about this LiDAR technology is normally in surveying, you can get your XY positions fairly well and your Zs are a little bit more difficult to get. In this, you can get Z a lot better than you get your XYs. So your XYs can be out a factor of seven to eight times what your vertical errors might be. So you might have a very accurate level, but you're not too sure where it is on the ground. <laughs> okay. In version 14, just a bit of a plug for version 14, there's a cloud, uh, point cloud surface thinning option, which is hard coded to what we do. And it's a very neat function in the way that you can now drape strings through these point clouds. It's very neat, very fast. Just an example of um, this reduction that I've been talking about. If you can see on the uh, left-hand side there, all those little green dots are the original LiDAR spots. So there's a lot of them and they're all over the place. Our thinning option, which has been run on the stuff on the right-hand side in magenta, it concentrates those points where you have changes in grade, like a survey. So that reduces that down. That's a lot less than your original points. And as a sort of an indication, that's the contours. On the left, I'm not too sure if it shows up. That's the original contours. Um, in green, they're jiggity, jaggedy, <laughs> don't look real pretty. Um, and on the right, in magenta again, is the it shows up from here, hope it shows up from up there. The contours are a lot smoother and not a bad approximation of what you had. So, yep, you can thin these things and makes them usable. And at 12% of the original data set, they can be incorporated into your design stuff without a lot of drama. Okay, UAV lighters, UAV lighter. Um, we've had one successful project in this. Now that's basically the full scale plane stuff on a little, on a little um, UAV. This is one of the 30 to 40,000 ones that um, Global Pies there is out the front there. Um, that's not a really good photo of the, um, the drone, but it does sort of give an idea of the scale of these things. They're quite, quite large because they've got to hoist a um, LiDAR scanner underneath them, which is a couple of kilos of stuff. And where we used it was in that horrible space on the, in the picture on the right. Classic case of access was very difficult, dangerous in that 
gully there, it's very sandy, it's prone to collapse. We had absolutely brilliant results out of that. That LIDAR penetrated through all the lantana there, picked up all the, the ground, unbelievable result. And that's just the plot of what came out of it. As you can see, there's quite detailed, quite rough underneath. Another version is mobile laser scanning, basically where they put a laser scanner on the back of a ute, drive it down the road. This is very good for collecting big amounts of data. Um, you don't interfere with the traffic, you don't have to close roads down. Um, you can get more accurate measurements than out of your LIDAR, um, high level LIDAR stuff. Um, we've had limited experience with the outputs. We did have a, get a, um, a data set from TMR of the busway, which was really useful. We managed to go through that and extract some long sections and cross sections of the busway for some preliminary works, really useful. So, you know, when I say they haven't found a home, they do have some really useful things. Um, the other one is UAV photogrammetric, which Noel was talking about yesterday. Um, I'm pleased Noel spoke before me because I was sort of going to bag this stuff a bit, but Noel is one of the good guys with this stuff. Noel does know about survey control and he does know about categories in it. I did not realise you could get categories out of the um, photogrammetric stuff. Um, we've had some of this stuff. There's a lot of people out there who go down to JB, buy their, buy their drone and set themselves up, think they know what we're doing. We've had data come in which is useful to some extent, but there have been twists in the um, plane of vertical datum. So these things are slide through your jobs. They're just very, if you get a bad set, data set, it's, you can't do anything with it. But it's quite inexpensive and very useful in some cases. If you're doing um, particularly clean area sites like stockpiles and stuff like that, I imagine that would be big old. Then there's terrestrial laser scanning. Um, that was one of our early experiences was with scanning bridges and that one there is a bridge, a suspension bridge in, uh, out at Indrapilly. Uh, there's a bit of a history, those cables that hold that up were the cables that were used to, in the manual, and when they were building Sydney Harbour Bridge to keep it in place until they joined it up. So they've been repurposed. Um, why we, that was scanned so that they were going to do some maintenance on it. It's been there for however long and they've never been game to undo any plates on it in case the whole thing unravelled. So the structural engineers were trying to figure out what they could do to this thing. So um, it, was, it was scanned. Years before that, um, myself and another surveyor spent a Saturdays or a Saturday set up on top of those pylons, measuring it with um, total stations. And we had the bridge shut down and trucks and it was just horrible. And you wouldn't think it'd be a workplace health and safety issue now to go and set up on top of one of those things, would you? <laughs> so laser scanning gets you away again from all that um, issues with the, the, work, the safety. We've done it for architectural, we've scanned buildings where they've been looking about um, different renovations. One of the big uses is scanning um, drainage manholes and structures. That is sort of where our, um, our big focus is going to be at the moment to the extent we've bought ourselves a laser scanner. We haven't fired it in anger yet but we bought one. To this point in time we've been getting our data from uh, external suppliers. Okay, what have we learned so far? It's very efficient at collecting a data set. Um, it's a very practical option when you come to issues of access and safety. Again, even in this laser scanning, you don't need all the points, which that's fine to say you don't need all the points, but what do you do to get the ones you do need? Um, not all clouds are the same. I would have thought once when I first looked at these, you get a point cloud, and that looks like a point cloud, and that one looks like a point cloud. But when you get into them, they're all different. And I have to say big thank you to Alan Gray because I don't know how many times I would say, Alan, 
I've got another one of these and we can't read it in or it's looking funny. We had one point cloud that was in lats and longs. Um, it's just the variability is astounding. And that's before you get to the variability in the suppliers, which is something else we found out about. It is a really highly skilled um, area. You need really good surveyors to give you a really good tight point cloud. Um, file extension on a reliable indicator of the contents. You know, they've got standards. Um, but there is, there is, uh, a, there's standards out there for point clouds. So they have these standard extensions, but we get these point clouds and when we try to read them into 12D and they use the organisations who set the standards validator, the message comes up, this is not a valid file. So, and that's it. And you say, well, if you're using the organisation that sets the standards standard and it fails, it's not a standard file. It turns out that um, Autodesk have become very involved in this space and they have lots of bits of software that do this. And they write these files out as E57s, but on the way out, particularly in the earlier versions, they just sort of did some things that made them not quite standard. They'd read into other Autodesk products, but not into ones that use the, the validator. And that's not only 12D, there are other software packages out there that refuse to use, read these things. Um, one of the things we learned was that the marketing abilities can exceed the technical capacities. Um, that's nice political talk to say, you can really get caught by the marketing of these things. Um, there's a lot of money, more money going into the marketing, or the effort goes into the marketing more than the production of the product at the end. And the thing going around at the moment is scan to BIM, which when you read that you think, oh, I've got a point cloud, I just throw this point cloud at something and I end up with all my stuff extracted into these nice BIM features that everybody's been talking about. I went to the Grand Prix in March and there was a crew down there had hired a tent at the Grand Prix which would have cost them, cost them mozza. And they were pushing this scan to BIM and one of the guys collared me and he said, we've got this scan to BIM, the magic button. And I said, okay, what does this magic button do? And on pursuing it, what it means is they package all this stuff up, send it offshore with some vague specification and stuff comes back and then they got to sort it all out. So it's not a nice transparent process. And you, if you can imagine what happens when this stuff goes offshore, there's multiple people over there working on the same stuff. What they do is quite good, but you don't have the transparency, you don't know what's happened to your data. And that's one of the things that gives you your variability in the, the point clouds. Um, it's not civil design ready. I don't think it is. It's very useful, but it's not something that every designer is going to be using, loading into their jobs quite yet. They are valuable. There's a way to go yet. And the other thing is 12D can manage point clouds. I'm not too sure what you're going to, what you want to do with them, but it can read them in. Some of the point cloud outputs, you get point clouds, obviously, which is a good record of what was there. Uh, you can extract objects, vectors, points, surfaces, tins. Viewers is a very good um, output of them. That uh, takes a photo type thing, it, it's a viewer that runs in a web browser and you can measure off that, you can walk through it like um, Street View or something like that. And the use is a geospatial forensic, it's even used in movies, it's used a lot in movies these scanners, so they're around. Um, just a bit there on 12D and point clouds, that's some of the stuff that's available in um, 14, you can read in the formats, you can convert between formats, you can do projection transformation. Uses string cloud element, which is a very peculiar element. Um, version 14 if, is the version to start playing. If you want to look at point clouds, try version 14. It is so much better. The perspective view is so much more reliable. You can select in it. It's really good. Um, but there on point cloud functionality, there's a lot of stuff you can do. As I mentioned, there's draping against point clouds. 
which is very nice. Um, yeah, till you've touched them, it probably doesn't mean much. But as you can see, 12D is starting to get in involved in point clouds. There's stuff there you can do with it. So where are we at? Load our point clouds. We say, happy days, we've, we've got them nailed. We're starting to scan drainage chambers. We're scanning buildings. Um, we've embarked on data extraction and modelling, um, getting vectors, trimeshes and pipes. We're at the stage of writing a specification to get stuff extracted. Um, and just as an example there, we've got... That's one of our manholes that we've had scanned. As you can see, it looks quite detailed, but not, not something you can do a lot with. You can do things... I've sort of been playing around with them and using some of the tools in there. You can do things like slice the point clouds, which you can see the shape, which is like taking a section through them. Um, and through, through that, I've actually managed to build a, um, a tri-mesh out, out of the point cloud. So that reduces, you know, several million points to something that's, that's quite manageable. Um, and that was quite simple. That was just a circular one. But now the stuff we've got is, is these odd-shaped ones that sit below the ground. Um, you need to... Our designers need to know where these things are so they don't bang into them. These things are getting quite old. They're brick. Some of them are heritage listed, which a lot of the public don't see, but <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is. But as you can see, you can once you do that, it does add a lot of context to what you're dealing with down under the, under the surface. You've got to bear in mind, though, that that is the inside of the structure. And if you can see there the... Um, I've coloured the tri-meshes and you can see the spots around them. That sort of gives you an indication that you must be close. If you can see a bit of a point cloud inside and a bit of point cloud outside, you're pretty close to where you should be with your tri-mesh. That's another example of um, a structure that we've had modelled for us not so long ago. It's a um, heritage listed thing. There was about 30 metres of this underground structure. Um, quite impressive. Um, yeah, as you can see, it picks up all sorts of stuff in the point cloud. In the middle there, just to the, um, just to the left of the orange column, that's a bit of rope hanging down that's been caught up in there in some stage and there's all sorts of daggy stuff caught up in it with the water that's flown through there. This is the viewers, one of the view, an example of one of the viewers, and that's the sort of stuff you can get out there. And you can measure stuff in there, but you can see the, um, the sewer pipe, the metal sewer pipe that runs through there. A um, lot of detail there. You can even see the um, in the porphyry blocks there. That's been hand cut back in the day. Old mate is standing there in the corner. I got the fright of my life when I was sort of first looking around there and I spun around and saw him looking back at me in the view. It's, um, but that's... So you can see from that, there is value in that. Our designers, it just adds that extra bit. That's another example of... Uh, or the previous one, sorry, was just... That one is all based on the intensity of the returns from the point cloud. There's not much light down there, so you, it uses the intensity to give that image. That one there is a colour point cloud, same sort of thing. You can level points, measure off points between it. But not everything in that one. That's, as I said, it combines the, it combines the image and the point cloud. You can measure from the points that have got... Um, points in the image that... Get this right. In there, some of, those, some of that image has points behind it from the point cloud. If you get one of them, you can measure a distance. Up in the sky, you can't measure a distance because there is no point cloud there. So they can be a little bit disorienting when you get that. But unbelievably useful to figure out, just add that context to your job and what you're doing. That one there, classic case of we had that scan, that's Anzac Square in Brisbane. Lots of inf information, lots of points. All we were after is down on the side there, you can see we extracted some vectors around the around the window frames and doors and a few of the building structures. That's zoomed in close. As you can see, it all fits in really nicely and neatly. 
Um, we had all that point cloud, millions of points came out to a couple of hundred strings was all they really wanted out of that. But we have that point cloud now as a record of anything that might go on in the future. Same sort of thing there. Um, that's our standard DTM survey, coloured up a bit with those building elements down the side of the um, side of the park. This is where we're going now. We're looking towards is tri meshes. We're extracting them from point clouds. It's um, some of the areas you go to. There is so much detail that if we were to pick them up conventionally, just the standard strings it becomes meaningless because you can't disentangle the amount of information. So our approach on this project is to scan them and get um, trimeshes extracted to reduce the amount of information plus make it more obvious what's, what's there. Um, once again, do you really need to be able to measure to all those lights? Who knows? They need to know there are lights there. Does it have to be 100% a replication of the light? Probably not. Plus there's a bit of a, um, the other thing in there is we're starting to colour our DTM surfaces. So that just mixes together th through there as the one, one visual thing. Um, there's a big difference between survey data and design data. It's a lot harder to get survey data because it's so random to be into tri meshes and to look like your standard design stuff. And I think we're nearly there. That is another example. We've had those red things there are cabinets that have been extracted from the tri-mesh, but we've got the point cloud overhanging that stuff, so you can see that we're still close. And there's a lot of information that wasn't modelled. There's a lot of cables and stuff there. So if you decide at a later date, we can go back in there and we can measure those cables. We can extract the stuff. And 12D is probably the stage now for just for isolated stuff like that. You could go back in there yourself and extract that out of the point cloud yourselves. That's just a bit there. We are developing um, mapping files. And a 12B field codes, you might think that 12B field codes files are just for surveyors, but it's a very good way of combining your um, string names and any attributes you might want to use into a standard 12B format that's got a very nice interface. And we can now, um, all of those tri meshes are getting extracted. We can run them through our auditing um, routines to make sure that they're rightly named, right models and all that sort of thing. The future, we, built a, we bought ourselves a 360 scanner, we've just got to learn to use it. We're developing our specification, we're developing our in-house skills. And we're educating our users. We think 12B Viewer will probably be the way to do that. A lot of the people who are interested in this are the non-technical type people, so if we can manage to get point clouds or cut down point clouds in there for them to use. We think that that'll be um, one way to take us a little bit further. And Thank you.